Okay, so uh, this talk's a bit different. We're not talking about you know uh, libraries or you know things to manage cloud. We're talking about kind of data and where data is moving uh, on the web. Um, so basically, if you're using HTML5, uh, RDFA, uh, JSONLD, how many of you in here use JSON? Should probably be like every hand. <laughs> yeah, okay, so this is about how you take JSON data and make it more webby. Uh, that's effectively what. What we're going to discuss today. Uh, hi, I'm Monin. Uh, I'm the uh, W3C Standards Chair for the RDFA Group at the World Wide Web Consortium. Uh, I do a lot of like data stuff, so I'm the chair of uh, RDFA, Chase and LD. Uh, I also do a lot with identity and security, working with the Mozilla Persona team. Uh, and we focus a lot of these technologies, a lot of these low-level technologies like JSON LD and RDFA, they're all being built to execute upon this idea that we should have payments as a core service of the web. We should build payments into the core of the web. Uh, and so a lot of the technologies that we're going to be talking about today, mm -hmm. that's the reason they exist. Uh, it just so happens that they can be used for a variety of other really mm -hmm. cool you know, data processing uh, tasks. Uh, I'm also the founder and CEO of a company that works on web payments uh, infrastructure. Uh, and I spent a lot of time kind of looking at uh, uh, a ton of different stacks. Like I said, identity, security, data, link data, how do you get all of these things kind of working together and move move this things things like identity to a more web-like mechanism. Because right now, if you think of identity on the web today, it's pretty siloed. You know, by Facebook, Twitter, you've got login accounts on each one of those, how do you make that more web based um, and Jason LD and RDF is one, one way of, of uh, doing that. Um, so here's, here's the general problem, and a lot of people don't think that this is a problem uh, on the web, but we have, we have a lot of information on the web. When I think of the number of web pages out there and, links and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and web pages are human readable. You can tell someone to go to you know, google.com and they can read the page and kind of understand what's going on. Um, but a machine can't necessarily go to the page and understand what's on the page. So for example, if you do a search for a name, uh, a machine doesn't understand that there are five people on that page, there are six events on that page. None of that information is really readily accessible. Um, and that's a, big, uh, that's, that's a big problem, because if we, if we get a small bit of machine-readable data in these web pages, we can start automating what the machines can uh, uh, do for us. So for example, uh, think of this, this meetup you know, right here. If we had machine-readable data just embedded in the page, it would have been very easy for your web browser to say, ah, I know that there's an event, a Beethoven area meetup happening. Do you want me to insert that in your calendar? Instead of you going to have to find the, you know, add to my calendar button and hope, hoping that it actually integrates with your calendaring program. So being able to transfer this data that's on the web in an easy way, a machine-readable way, uh, to your calendaring software is just one of the things um, that you can do um, with technologies like RDFA and JSON LD. So the whole point, what we're trying to do, is we're trying to take human-readable machine, human-readable information on the web, things like people, places, events, uh, transactions, you know, contracts, things like that, mark it up in a way that machines can understand it and process it. Because you can't do that uh, today, not very, not very easily, not in a general way. Um, so this is all built on this concept called linked data. Uh, linked data is a concept that was introduced by Sir Tim Berners Lee, the guy that invented the web. Um, and he, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but the, the web wasn't necessarily meant to just be a document story. When, when it was created, it was meant to be both readable and writable. You were supposed to be able to open a web browser, look at a web page, comment on the web page, cut and paste items uh, among, uh, you know, in it, and not just on your website, but any website out there. Right? That was the that was the vision, and we quickly scaled back on that vision because we didn't have a lot of the technology that we needed to, to do that. Uh, identity security, all those mechanisms didn't really exist, so the web became kind of read only, uh, and, and and specifically it became read only for humans. Right? Machines couldn't really, the only thing that a web browser really does is it just reads you know, the HTML, renders it in a certain way. It has no idea what concepts are in that, uh, in that document. Um, so linked data is, is a new way of publishing data on the web in an interoperable way. There are four main principles. One of them is using universal identification mechanism, which is the URL. Right? 
right? There's people still creating their own ID mechanisms. Stop doing it. Use the URL. It's universal. It, it works, right? We have we have a, a very long history now of URLs being a good identifier, uh, identification mechanism. So linked data uses URLs to identify things. Uh, period. Um, when you go to a link, you want to find useful information at the end of that link, right? Um, you. Uh, when, when, you, when you have an identifier that's a URL, you want to be able to kind of copy and paste it into your browser and have something useful come up. The same should apply to um, uh, applications processing data. If an application is going to come across a URL in, in the data, it should be able to dereference that on the web and get another machine readable document that it can actually understand uh, from that application. This, this isn't just an HTML document. It's something that the machine can actually process. Um, the other other thing with uh, linked data is uh, please use web standards to express information. Right. So if you if you think of the way that Twitter and Facebook expresses information, it's very specific to their business. Facebook has a certain way of representing uh, a person and events. Twitter has a completely different way of representing a person and events. They kind of use you know standards like they use JSON, but they don't go any deeper than that. Right? It's not really machine readable. You as a developer have to make sense of what that JSON means. There's no real interoperability between a Facebook person and a Twitter person and a Google Plus person. Um, and then of course the, the important thing with linked data is once you have this kind of entity, this object that's machine readable, link it to something else that's useful. right? Uh, which is which shouldn't be really that surprising to you because that's exactly how the web works. You have a web page, you have a whole bunch of links linking to other web pages, you follow those links, you find other useful information on them. It's really great for humans on the web today, but it really sucks for machines because a machine machine uh, data is usually siloed. So you go to Facebook's website and the only links that are uh, you know the only links that they expose to you are other links to Facebook, you know, websites or Facebook, Facebook concepts. Um, so basically, four four main things uh, about with data. Um, what we're trying to build here is uh, something that looks like this, right? So you've got a person here. This is kind of a data node in linked data, and you've got um, relationships to other pieces of data on the web. Um, so for example, this person has a friend. That's this, uh, they watch Netflix, they like cooking, that type of food. They like the Facebook uh, FA conference. Uh, they have another friend uh, that's that person, right? And, and these things can these things can and should exist on other websites. So let's say this is this person's website. This stuff can exist on another website, right? That's the linked part of linked data. You want to be able to have this gigantic global graph of information that you can start on one node a machine can start on one node and kind of follow links to other nodes uh, out there on the on the web. Um, this might look familiar to you because this is Facebook Open Graph based on linked data. There is the uh, uh, Google just bought a company whose name is escaping me uh, that basically had this gigantic linked data mechanism that when you do search Google searches now, they expose some of that. That data to you also uh, with data. So yeah. Free bits. Free bits. Thank you. Yes. So yeah. And yeah, and so 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 Google's using this stuff underneath the scenes. Uh, Facebook's <coughs> using it. Um, there are IBM's using it. Watson. If you guys ever saw the Watson supercomputer play Jeopardy, that was all based on like data technology. Um, so this stuff is being used in production. It's, it it is very useful for those large companies. What we're trying to do is get this into kind of developer hands. Three letter agencies. Say again? Three letter agencies you might have heard of. Yes. NSA, CIA. Very interested in the linked data because it allows them to, to connect the dots. Um, so, so basically, uh, let's talk about two of those technologies really quickly RDFA. RDFA makes web page data machine readable. Uh, by machine readable, I really, I'm, I'm trying to say machine understandable without planting the notion that this is some kind of advanced artificial intelligence technology because it's not, it's not a magic bullet, but it does allow machines to ex extract entities of the page like people, places, events, and then do something, process that data in a certain way. 
Um, RDFA is useful if you're writing HTML. Um, RDFA is recognized by Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Yahoo, and Index. If you use RDFA to mark up your page, uh, they will be indexed um, in a different way than if they just had to hit your page and get keywords off of it. So if you mark up a person in your page, that is going to go into Google search engine in a different way uh, than if you did have any of this information in, in there. And what that does is it boosts your search engine ranking. Uh, so if you want to show up higher in Google search results, help them figure out how many people, places, events are on your website. Kind of so that's what, um, that's what RDFA does. Let's look at an example of this. Uh, if we, if we say who is the president of the UAE, we're asking Google a question. Right? This is a structured data question. Um, and what Google does to answer that question is they have this huge linked data graph that they query. And what they end up building from that linked data graph is this thing on the, on the side here. Right? This, is all, this is all linked data. And you can actually, um, so, so the question is who is the president of the UAE? Here's your answer. That's who the president of the UAE is. Um, they were born on this date. This is a relationship. So this person was born on this date. This person's spouse is this person. The office that this person holds is the president of the UAE. It's 2004. These are the children that this person has. Uh, lots of kids. Uh, this is this person's parents. Um, and then let's say we want to figure out something more. And this is all. This is this. Google does not expose this stuff in a machine readable way because that's their secret sauce. But behind all of this stuff is is linked data. So you you know go to the parents. Boom. There's more linked data, right? And you can keep following this around. And the idea is to not just have this siloed at Google. It's to turn the web into into this. A machine could start on that person's home page if the president of the web has a home page, um, and it could follow links to other places on the web that have. Uh, uh, information uh, about the topic that you're interested in. Let me see. This is actually working. Yeah. So, so we just followed it to uh, the city that he was born in, and this knows that it's a city in the UAE, and there's a description there. And then actually picked this data out of Wikipedia. Um, again, it, it used a certain, uh, a particular version of Wikipedia that's data only, and data only. Um, so, link data basically allows us to. Query uh, databases in a way that's very different from the way we query databases, structured databases today. It's it's more of an entity-based query. Who is this person? Where is this event? You know, how many people live in this, in this area? You can start asking rich questions like that using more data. Um, I'm trying to show you something else. Uh, so if you wanted to mark this stuff up in HTML, this is what it actually ends up looking like. We're not going to try and learn RDFA here, but we're basically saying, you know, we, we're using this vocabulary to describe an entity on this page, the type of entity we're describing is a person, the image for this person is this URL, the name of this person is the contents of the spam tag, the job title is here, telephone number is here, email address here, you know, their home page is here. And this is all this is all RDFA. HTML, RDFA data. And when Google goes to look at this information, what they're going to see is this. The search engine crawler is going to see this. There's one item on this page, that's the person. Their image is located here. This is their name, job title, yada, yada, yada. So if somebody does a, does a search for a person who is, you know, who is modern, Google can just surface this information directly. They trust the data. They can just surface it, surface it directly. So. Um, that's that's kind of one of the one of the benefits of um, link data is you know you show you show up much better in, in, in search results. Um, there are of course other things that we'll get into here. It's a social network. So as you can see, it's a graph of information. It looks like a tree, but you know these things are like that. But how is this different from like a graph? It's, it's the same thing. So graph database. This is it is a graph database, but the idea here is the graph database is the web. It's not a siloed thing sitting on some company server. It's you query a web page for data, get it back, and there's machine readable data that the machine can actually follow the link. So the spouse exists at this URL. Okay, I'm going to crawl to that URL. Give me the machine readable data on the page. Oh, this uh, this uh, the spouse's. Um, uh, First son's name is so and so. Okay, go to that URL. You know, 
know, get to extract the data off of that. So instead of hitting a database like we normally do today, which is something that we have under control in the part of the web, uh, you kind of follow the links, uh, follow your nodes to the, to the data that you're interested in. Um, so you can also Google score it. effectively implemented a version of that database by calling and um, this. Yeah, Google has one, Facebook has one, um, like Twitter probably has one. You got that one. Um, so, yeah, so events, uh, same kind of thing, right? It's a place uh, where, where the name of the events, the, the place where it's happening, the postal address. Uh, this is a product, They're, so the event has tickets in this price range, they have 1,000, 1,938 tickets left. There's a way that you can, you can, uh, you know, run a lot of the full rich data um, using mm -hmm. this technology. Um, so that's already a fact, right? Um, but RDFA is kind of, it, it's kind of neat, but not a lot of people have use for it. And the SEO people do, are the ones that use it the most. If you want to show up higher in Google search ranking, you use that, use RDFA. Um, but really what we want to focus on, and what I want to focus on today, um, is how do we do the same thing for JSON? How do we do it for the, for the, the JSON data that we use on a day-to-day -day basis? Is there a way for us to create JSON data that's interoperable between services? Is there a future here where Facebook could publish JSON data that is just interoperable like with Twitter right out of the gate, okay? or Google Plus? Um, and so, so uh, that's what JSON LD is. It's JSON for linking data. It means that all of a sudden the IDs that we use in JSON should be URLs. Uh, we can express graphs of information. You see, it still looks like the JSON that you're used to, uh, but instead of just doing a, a simple tree, you're actually expressing a graph of uh, information. Uh, it's most useful for REST-based web APIs. Um, uh, and if you want to store uh, data, uh, Link data in things like MongoDB or CouchDB, um, so you can you can use the data structures that you're used to working with in JSON, but you can and you can use the databases that you're used to using. You don't have to switch to a graph-based database, but you you are definitely working with linked data. Um, that's that's kind of one of the benefits of JSON LD. Google uses it in Gmail. How many of you use Gmail in here? So you're, you're using JSON LD. You, know, you might not know it. 425 million people are using JSON LD right now. Uh, Google Actions and Google Now are powered uh, off of it. So if you've ever um, if you've ever gotten a plane ticket and it said, "Do you want to enter this in Google Now?" that's powered by JSON LD. Uh, if you've ever gotten a reminder that your flight's leaving in 30 minutes or an hour and you need to leave to the airport, that's being powered by JSON LD. IBM's using it. Um, both for Watson, um, the next generation for Watson, and IBM is also using it for the activity streams work, which is an open social you know, networking protocol. Uh, Yahoo's using it, uh, AMX is using it. So we've got some big companies uh, kind of using it. So what he does uh, boils down to two main concepts. So how do you take the JSON data that you have now, and how do you make it machine readable? Right? What, what changes do you have to do? Uh, the, the first one is to basically pick a vocabulary. How are you going to express this information in a common way such that you as a developer communicating with some other developer in the world that you've never met uh, end up calling uh, something by the same thing, uh, by the same name. So for example, let's take name, right? Uh, so an example of a vocabulary term is name, which is a word or a set of used, uh, words uh, that you use to address something. So uh, people have names, places have names, things like that. Um, but like I said, everything in the linked data world uses a URL to identify things. So you can't just use name. You actually have to use a URL. Right? So schema.org is Google's way of expressing uh, uh, it's their vocabulary. Um, and name is packed on the end. So whenever we say this object has a property, we don't just say this object has a property called name. We use the full URL so everyone knows that we're talking about the same kind of name. This isn't a dog's name. It's not, you know, the name of a, a, a chair or a, you know, a building. This is a very generalized, you know, type of name uh, that we're using. Uh, and the nice thing about linked data and vocabularies is that anybody can publish these on the web. You don't have to be Google to publish a linked data vocabulary. 
the other thing with uh, JSON LD that's important is the context. So um, whenever you have a conversation with someone, there's always some kind of context that the conversation happens in. So you can say, uh, hey, I was just talking with Ken the other day. And, and based on the context, you probably know that you're talking about the same Ken, right? There's a shared context there where you don't necessarily have to use their last name. Um, data is no different. Whenever you exchange data between two organizations, you want to use the same vocabulary, you want to use the same kind of context, uh, which means that you can shorten things to things, you know, to something like name. You don't have to use even a org slash name to refer to something. You can just say, we're using the same vocabulary, so let's just call this thing name, this, this, this property name. Um, so basically, JSON-LD uses a context, something called a context. Uh, to map vocabulary terms uh, or the terms to vocabulary URLs to give data some kind of meaning. We'll take a look at what this looks like uh, here in a second. Um, so let's let's look at a person in JSON LD. Right? We're going to remove we're going to remove the context. So this is. Can everyone kind of see this? Can you make it a little bit bigger? Uh, Maybe. I was hoping you would ask that. I didn't ask that. Uh, is that right? Yes, it's bigger. It's bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how, how about that? That's responsive. That's that? Impressive. Yes, it's responsive. <laughs> I have no idea what's going to happen. It's lots of things. Um, so this is what your JSON, this is what your JSON uh, data looks like today, right? You've got a name, you've got a home page. If you exchange this data with somebody else out there on, on the web using your REST API, they have they, they don't really know what you meant by name, right? You might you might mean something subtly different with with the way you're using name and homepage. They you might use a URL for homepage. They might think oh they meant the title of the homepage. So all of a sudden when you start to merge all this data together, you've kind of got a mass of you know homepage URLs and homepage titles, right? Which means that you 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 didn't figure out what the vocabulary was that you're that you're going to use. Um, now if we actually add a context in here, and we map name to something, then there's no uh, chance that you're going to be miscommunicating, at least with the context. There's still user error, right? But the idea here is you're saying, let's go back here and put a context in here. So we're saying name maps to this URL. Whenever I use name, what I'm really saying is this, right? But nobody wants keys that look like that uh, in their JSON data. It would be a nightmare to work with it, right? We still want to use our JSON data like we've always used our JSON data, so we're going to keep referring to this as name. Uh, homepage, this is basically shorthand to say, when I say homepage, I mean this, right? This is the vocabulary term I'm, I'm using. Um, and it's, a, it's an ID, it's a type of ID, which means it's a URL. So the thing on the right-hand side, so I'm going to say homepage on the left-hand side, and the thing on the right-hand side is always going to be a URL, or it really should be a URL, right? If you don't use a URL, you're violating the contract that we have. So this is the context. So the, the conversation is happening in this context, and then we mark our data up like this. Right? You still end up using your JSON data like you, like, you, like you used to before, but now um, somebody can use a generalized processor on the JSON data and extract name and home page and map it to their application uh, uh, fairly easily, right? So they can they can say, oh, I know that, um, you know, I, I I know that when they say name, they mean this, and in my system, this means something very specific. So I know that I can map, you know, the, the name here um, to my application losslessly. There's no there's not going to be any kind of confusion over whether they mean this type of name or some other type of name. So in this case, the name actually maps to the URL. Um, XML and whatever, right? right yeah. In, but the home page maps to that entire URL. So this, this, this So think of it, I'll, I'll show you uh, an example here in a, in a second, but think of this whole thing. When, when somebody types this out, mm -hmm. this entire thing that's moved and chucked down here, in the machine readable form of it, right? The, the nice thing about JSON is it's human readable and fairly human editable, but when the machine goes to process it, it replaces name with this big gigantic URL, and it replaces homepage with this gigantic URL. What, what does that mean, what you have on the right? What, 
This on the right? Yeah, does that have any meaning at that point? Uh, yeah, it does, because it's saying, so this is the vocabulary term that you're using. Mm -hmm. So this is what I, you know, this is name, and this is the value of name. Oh, okay. Key value, key value, oh, key value. Okay. Same, key same value. thing, yeah, same yeah, thing with, with JSON. Right. Um, so these are key values, it's just we're being very specific about the, the key, the type of vocabulary type that we're, that we're using. Um, so let me go it's down. actually a key value. Right, yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's a little more complicated uh, than that. Um, so let me, let's, let's see, so. I guess the key and the value being the URLs to be there, but. The, val the value in one of these is the URL, the other one it's just a string. So the value can be either a string or a URL. So here we have one value is a string, one value is a URL. Right, right. Um, and, so, and so that's another good point. You can't really type stuff in JSON. In JSON, everything's a string. In JSON LD, something can be a string, a date, a URL, and it's it's a little more strongly it's a little more strongly typed. You don't go as far, you know, throw errors or whatever um, uh, when it's not. But you can you can be specific. You can say, you know what, this vocabulary term really should be a URL. I strongly suggest that you make it a URL. You can't do that in JSON. Um, so so let's look at this. So, so the JSON you end up using it in compacted form. So usually this stuff kind of disappears, um, and you still use it like a JSON object. But what happens behind the scenes here, let's go ahead and apply this context to this data. This is only what the machine sees, so don't get freaked out by it. But um, in expanded form, what we end up seeing, see this? See how name has been expanded to this? Or sorry, homepage has been expanded to this? Mm -hmm. And then we say that it's an ID, so if it's in this URL, and this is what the value of homepage is. And here we've taken name and we've expanded it, and name is actually a string value, and this is the value associated with it. Right? So this is what the machine sees. Um, and, and it just lets us be very, very specific about, you know, this is the vocabulary term that we're using, this is the data that's associated with it. Um, so if you can imagine Facebook basically uh, using uh, this mechanism um, and Twitter using the mechanism to, let's say, express a name, if Facebook and, and Twitter could agree on just this one URL for, for marking up names, then you've got portable data between both systems. Um, we'll get into some of the other crazy things that you can do with this uh, LD in a bit. Um, so let's look at, let's say, events. So again, this is a completely different, probably a bad example, but um, you can do namespace in JSON LD. I suggest that you don't do that because it's just going to confuse a bunch of people. Um, but you can have things like dates uh, in, in JSON LD that are strong uh, uh, type. So this is basically using the iCal format, which is the calendar, calendaring format. Uh, and this, is, this, even though it's a string in the JSON data, um, when you convert it to JSON LD, you know that it's a date because of the context. Context is basically telling you whenever you see this term, it's a date, right? It's not just a regular, regular string. Um, any questions so far? You know, we're kind of jumping around a bit. Are there different forms of uh, this date? Is this really a formatting? And is there like a floating point since 1970 form as well that would be defined by that document? Or? Yeah, yeah, so you could do XSD float here, and that would be a very specific type of like triple flow. But, but if, it was a, if it was still a date and time, or does that, are those two things in conflict? So, so specifically, this isn't just a date time. This is specifically a XML schema date time, which defines separately a syntax for how date times are formatted. Um, okay. so, so in this case, we're saying this is this kind of date time. You could very easily say, and there is such a thing as a epoch, as, as a you know, as a double counting since the epoch kind of date time, and say right. this is how that is, and and then the definition for that data type would have to say how do I convert that into another kind of data, okay. type. And, and you can say all of that in JSON. And then we can create these ourselves, or you're yep. picking from W3. You can create them yourselves. That's a URI. If you need a new data type, well, beware, but you know. Yeah. Don't create one, but if you really, really need to, you can. Yeah. Yeah. With a bit of luck, you won't have to, right? Yeah, right, exactly. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the whole question of the, the getting permission to innovate. There's no getting permission to innovate with JSON update. You, you may need so forgiveness to, later. But you hope that yeah. everyone's innovated <laughs> your problem before you. Right, exactly. And in most cases, they have. Like, the XSD stuff has been around since, like, 99. 2001. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, it's extremely hard to find data you cannot represent using the XSD types combined with a graph syntax like JSON LD. Extremely hard. Right, yeah. The, the reason that you use a graph based um, uh, data format is because it can represent just about any human idea that you can think of. There are, there are corner cases where you can't necessarily do that, but in general, if you need to model something, um, a graph-based data format, you can do it. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, you have to wonder the, the concept of subject group or object group. Yeah. I want to see the predicate object or something. Yeah, you do, you do. So this is a this is a, a blank. Uh, let, me, uh, let me see if I've got it. Uh, you put the Infods tab down there. Yeah, but that's a blank note. Oh, yeah, it's not a blank note. Let's know. Let me see if the products. Uh, yeah, there you go, right down at the bottom there. Okay, ID. Um, yeah, so this is a test one that's for sale. <laughs> you want to buy it. Um, and so, so what you can do is, you know, this, this context, I'm going to just delete this context here. Um, uh, but the idea here is, oh, that's sad. So what I've done is uh, I basically took that data and I added an ID. So with, it, with a graph, you have node, link, node, right? Uh, that's the, so you've got subject, property, object. That's typically how you would represent a graph. This is the subject. It's a URL. We give URL identifiers to everything that we talk about. Um, and so that's that's what we're talking about uh, here. It's this this node. This node has a link going out called homepage. So the link's home page, and then this URL here is the object, right? So that's, that's one piece of information here. The other piece of information is another link called name that goes out, and this node is bonus point, right? That, that information there. So that's how you create, create you know, links. And you could actually follow the home page link here. So, you know, we've got a home page link to a node here. You can do machine readable, you can you know, get the machine readable data off of here, and then all of a sudden, pop, 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 you've got other links coming out of that web page that could sit on a completely different website, right? And then you follow one of those links, and you could keep going on and on to the ends of the, uh, ends of, ends of the web. Uh, did that answer the question? So ID is the way to represent the node? Yeah, it, it, that, that, that names the node. It gives the, the node a URL. You can have on names, nodes, you know, but let's not name that. Um, so you, you can basically name the node by giving it an ID. You can say this is the this is the URL that's that I'm assigned, uh, assigned to the node. Um, let's see if there's uh, this is an example of a product. I'm assuming you guys probably have a be able to see that. So remember the context that we were talking about? That can all be compressed out into a single URL. So you can have a vocabulary document or a context. And instead of having this big, gigantic, you know, 300 terms that you're trying to use, you can just publish it on the web, refer to it in a context, um, and then just start using, you know, the, just start expressing stuff using, using JSON. So in, in this particular context, we've aliased at ID to just ID because it's easier if people need to look at. Um, and then this is the ID for the object that we're talking about. Its type is both an asset and an album. The creator of this is a thing called the Arctic Monkeys. The title of this uh, album is Humbug. Uh, the content is provided there. The provider, uh, the, app, the person uh, providing the, the asset for sale effectively is this. Um, like I said, the reason that we're creating this technology is not because we have a lot of spare time and we're like, you know, dealing with esoteric uh, 
problems. It's because we're trying to build payments into the core architecture of the web. We're trying to express this information in a decentralized way on the web. No centralized databases, centralized anything is, is bad in general. Um, so in order to express this product in a machine readable way such that when your browser comes across it, you can click buy, you need to be able to express the information they send it in a machine readable way. JSON LD is effectively the, the, the way to do that. Um, you can also uh, express things like financial transactions in here. So whenever, let's say you swipe your credit card, this is the way you express a purchase um, of, of an item here. So your, your credit card swipe gets an ID, that's a URL. That's discoverable. Um, the idea here is that you should be able to hit the REST API of your bank and get your transaction information. Not just how much money you spent, but an explanation of the exact product that you purchased, um, uh, the warranty information associated with it, uh, 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 the financial transfers that happened, how much you paid in tax, who you paid it for, who you paid it to. Um, for example, if you buy, like, let's say, an album and there are four band members in the album, uh, you should be able to split that, trans that, that transaction and see those splits uh, in, your, in your initial receipt. Right? There's a lot of information, uh, important metadata that we can shove into these financial transactions that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you avoid using the JSON numbers? Sorry? Do you view, avoid using the JSON number type? Uh, yes. Yes and no. It depends. <laughs> if you're using integers, no, not really. If you're using like floats for money, yeah, definitely avoid using float JSON floats. If you're doing it yourself, yeah, avoid them. Yeah. Strings, just please use the string if you have a number and you care about it coming out improperly at the other end. Right, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I mean that's that's basically an overview of JSON LD. What we're trying to do is you know machine readability uh, on the web. Um, we're trying to do it in a way that is compatible with the way people use like published data on the web today, which is just using JSON. Um, more than likely, your company is not going to have a big use for this today, but you're going to see Google and Facebook and Twitter and people that have REST APIs increasingly publishing data in this manner. Um, so, so, and it would be great if you end up publishing your, you know, your company's data in this way. It will make it a really useful resource uh, to people. But most most companies are not at that scale. You are not Google publishing, you know, 350 million uh, uh, accounts about people or, or you know, pieces of data about people or events, you know, things like that. Yeah, speaking from experience, even publishing a few thousand can make it easier to find you. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, do you have an example of the context file? Because presumably, or, or would, or would well, that should work? Yeah. So let's go to this URL. <laughs> By demo. By demo. Say it. Work is smart. Yeah. I think this is going to download it, unfortunately. And you don't have a JSON LD parser for Chrome? Uh, well, that's that's the same <laughs> What is going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen. Oh! <laughs> 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 anyway, I, I, can, I can pose the question. Notepad, notepad. Not notepad. Come on. Right. Yeah, which uh, doesn't understand character class. Oh, which doesn't understand. What else? Wordpad? Is it Wordpad? Yeah, I won't understand it either. Well, I mean, it's all right, man. The, the question was that you have, when cool. you have uh, indented, JSON objects, presumably they're, every field name is in that context. And they yeah. Every, every, yeah, I mean, every, the, you, the, you, can't, you can't have a field called A in an outer shell and a field called A, you know, indented in, which have different types. You can if you embed the context, but we, were, we but, tell but, yeah. people not to do that. Exactly. It so, gets really confused. So, yeah. yeah. So, so basically, once you've used A in the outside, you go and use A further in, unless it's one of the magic known ones, such as that ID. Uh, no, you, you can you can do it. You can have you can have multi blasted So on the outer level, you can have context A, and on the inner level, you can have context B. And when your processor gets into the inner level, it will use context B. Right. Where, when you do the context in line, 
but what no. I'm, I'm thinking about when you do this context file. Uh, yeah, the context file is flat. It's flat. And so, so for example, a, 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 a field name that's inside a, a, a structure has to be of the same type. As a, if, if, if there was a thing called name in the outside, there was a thing called name in, a, in another object called book, and it had a name inside it, both of those names have to be the same type, right? They, sh they should be. Yeah. They and and they should be. I mean, yes. if you really design your API to have two different fields with the exact same name that are then different, your developer's going to screw up anyway. That's probably true. Yeah. So the human being is going to screw up, so yeah, the machine's going to screw yeah, up. Yeah, because I like, I like the idea that you've got this, this concept reference. Right. Especially, if, well, you know, I'm thinking we, we would use this on our OM thing. Yeah, yeah. Because at the moment, we have a typing problem. Right. Because we're, we're limited to... Yeah, my, my my double flow time is the thing that's really pissing me off right now. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So I don't want to know how many seconds it is since nineteen seventy. I want to just print it out in in the bureau. Yeah, exactly right. And and then you and, and since you're using a standard format, there are probably standard libraries to read that human readable string in and convert it into yeah, there is. what you want yeah. it to be. Yeah, but my, my developers are probably the one. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah. So, so this is what this is what a context file looks like. This this one looks really scary because this is something we're actually using in production to uh, process financial transactions. Um, not that scary. Not that long. Not scary. Uh, yeah, it's it's not that scary. Scary. Compared compared to what? Compared to <laughs> you know XML. <laughs> so, yeah. So have you got any of the banks to to, to do this in place of the? Uh, Bastardized quick and XML thing that, that you get to download from your website, from your. Yeah, what are banks company? saying? I mean, obviously talk to banks. What are they saying about? The, the the banks have no idea about technology in general. <laughs> I mean, the the banks really the banks. I went to talk to uh, most of the world banks several of them like a month ago, right, at the World Bank Conference. And they have a standardization body called SWIFT who deals with all the standards uh, uh, among the banks. And the bank's idea of cutting edge technology was XML. They were just adopting XML. Just, this is new, right? And the gen XML that they were using for an asset was open angle bracket ASP1739 close angle bracket. That is what is backing your financial transactions right now. <laughs> that is on the core banking network. So that, that, that's, that's state of the art right now. So the idea that they would, well, I'm on to the link data for that at this point in time is pretty strange. So, so if, if any of them uh, might be experimenting on an RDF layer, say, say they're using Mark Logic, for example, or something right. like that, do you think they have the propensity to eventually come over to this? or? How are you seeing the adoption sort of happen? I, mean, I, I think so. I mean, the, the, the really, the, like I said, sorry, I glossed over this in the beginning. The World Wide Web Consortium, for those that don't know in the room, are the people that create the standards for the web. Right? If you use a web browser, you use W3C tech. Right? That's where the, the vast majority of technology is created. So when we create a standard for the web, we try to do it in a very general way. And um, usually it's created by companies that have a very specific so we need web payment stuff to work. That's why we're working on JCLD. But, and we had no idea this was, was going to happen, Google adopted it for Gmail because they needed an easy way of expressing uh, data in a standardized way to the people that are building Gmail applications. And they used, they used JSONLD to do that because it was JSON and the developers were familiar with it. And it was, it was very easy for them to kind of just launch you know, JSONLD. Um, but we weren't expecting that at all. We had a couple of thousand deployments of JSON-LD. We were happy with that. And then the next day, Google makes the announcement that we have 425 million people more using the standard. So I can't really make any predictions on how. Because we don't know. It's, we, we always think we know how it's going to you know, go out there. But it, it never ends up happening the way we think it's going to happen. Um, so so the, nice, the, the nicest two adoption curves right now have been um, uh, Gmail which was, they took us from this to like that. Uh, and then IBM with their activity stream stuff. It's people that we've never talked to ever about this stuff that end up adopting it and just putting it, shipping it in product. Um, and that's kind of one of the, one of the 
watermarks for whether or not you've done a good job with your standards. People don't talk to you before they start using it. They just start using it, and then all of a sudden they ship something. You know, like um, so yeah, I don't know what the adoption curve is going to look like, and I don't know who's going to adopt it. But so far, Google and I've been adopted it. Are they are they exposing JSON LD APIs, or are they just using it internally? They're exposing it. So Gmail, they, they're telling all their Gmail developers, if you want to have Google Now Actions in um, Gmail emails, use JSON LD, and they they tell you in their developer documentation how to do it. Same thing with RDFA. You know, like if you want to express you know link data on the web, you can do it like this. Microdata is the other mechanism. It's really the primary mechanism um, for doing it in HTML for Google. So yeah, I mean, they, you know, people. There are companies adopting it, but it's difficult to tell who's actually going to end up um, when it's when it's going to happen. When how it's going to happen. Slides are there if you want to follow any of these links. Um, the Jason LD group is completely open. If you're interested in this stuff or want to ask questions about it, join the Jason LD group at the Worldwide Web Consortium. It's free. Um, Twitter handle, G plus handle. Um, Okay. If there are no other any other questions, yep. So, so a question about I presume when you're looking at a document, uh, the ID is like the, the URL that represents the document itself, right? Base URI resolution works exactly the same way it does for any other document on the web. Is the technical answer? Can you be more specific? So, like this saying? ID, is that ID this document? You can you can look at it as as that. Yeah. Uh, what you would expect is that. Yes. But you can talk about things out there on the web. So you can you, you can talk about, like on my website, I can talk about you. If you have a URL that you publish to the web, sure. I could be like, you know, HP, Ken, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ken Perkins is, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess where I'm going with this is the uh, the idea of, of web properties not having particularly good rigor with regards to URLs changing, mm -hmm. right? We see that all the time. Mm -hmm. And so then the idea of, like, what is a canonical URL for a resource? Mm -hmm. And how do how are you guys advising or setting the specification for like documents changing over time, and what is the authoritative document when it's represented as a URL, right? Right, right, right. And yeah, so, all really good questions. Like we know people are going to screw up, and the URL today is going to be this album, but maybe a week from now it might be something else. And so, like, how do you manage those types yeah, of problems? That's and exactly what's the plan? Right. There, there is, there is no. The plan for that is the same plan that we have for the web today, which is if you if you're good, well it's it's not it's not it's not no plan. Redirect. Redirect. If you value your customers or your developer community, create stable URIs and, and keep them around forever. Because the longer those URIs stay sure. around, the more data that's going to be associated with them, and you do not want to break that ecosystem. And, 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 I know. And, and RDF does have solutions for when you screw up. And there is, in fact, an RDF directive that says that this URI is really the same as that URI, um, which is a special kind yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. But How many of us have been on a product where a, a new product manager comes in or somebody that they changed the whole <laughs> framework, and now all your URLs changed? Yeah. And then you have to deal with, now we have to put in redirects or router <laughs> It's just yes. a great way to get rid of your developer community. A great way to get rid of your developer community. <laughs> I will remember that. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and that's really, the, that's the point with, you know, giving IDs, uh, uh, sorry, URLs to objects, is you want to create um, permanent URLs. And we actually, we have this, this service actually does that. This is a permanent <coughs> URL redirector service. This document actually lives somewhere else on the web. There's three, of, uh, three that happens um, when you hit it. But this site is meant to stay around for the lifetime of the web. Whether or not that will happen or not is, is up in the air. But there are multiple companies that have access to this website, and their job is to make sure that this site never, sure. ever, ever goes down. Right. So you can use a service like this if you're really worried about your... I, you know, I think about cases like Domino Records gets acquired by some other company who then wants to replace all the canonical URLs. Right. And then how do you deal with conflict resolution or aggregating these back into the same yeah. All yeah, and, 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 and it's really a, it's, it's how that company wants to deal with it, right? Because we, there's no one answer. So the standard actually requires a slight URL? Because I remember in the XML schema days, there, there is a namespace, but there's no expectation if you follow uh, the, the URL, there will actually be documents there. It doesn't yeah. have to be, because you can register it with a parser. Right. Can you do the same thing? With you you can, button? since it's linked data, and one of the principles of linked data is if you're going to use a URL, 
make sure that there's good data at the end of that URL. Uh -huh. that, that's it's a very strong suggestion. But you can you can just mint whatever URL that you want. The other thing that's interesting about the like, data stuff is like you can you know I can I can cr create some kind of site that slanders your name. Right? Mm -hmm. Ken Perkins is a jerk, right? And and, and, and I can in, introduce that into the into the into the uh, web of linked data. Um, and now machines have to understand that okay, that there's a fact that I read here, or there's a statement here, and there's a statement here, and they could very well be in conflict with one another, right? So the the uh, JSON LD is designed to work with a messy web. There's no we we completely given up on this idea that you can do data clean. Like data is messy; it's going to change. Links are going to die constantly, um, and that's just a fact of life. Get used to it. Chase and LD can help you model, you know, that information. Your application might have to sort through some of the bad data, but that's that's what the web is. Um, that, that kind of poses an interesting challenge, though, when you talk about integrating payments in the decentralized web, because then the payment provider may not be right. That's where, like, for better or for worse, Amazon solves that because they've centralized the payment process for you. Right. So as soon as you decentralize it, that messy data combined with payments right. seems like a challenge. It, 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 de it depends. There are certain parts of the data that are very important that they live at stable URLs. There are other parts of the data where you're just kind of like, you know. So for example, if Domino Records goes out of business and you, the, the thing that you bought from Domino Records was access to the song, right? So that's what's in the digital receipt. So when you, when you go to the digital receipt and you're like, oh, I want to view this thing again, you're going to go to the site and get a 404. Right. Sorry, Domino Records is out of business. You just lost your money. But the transaction still exists on your bank, you know, your bank, your bank system. Um, and if the bank deletes that transaction, that's serious, that you know, people going to jail and stuff. Right? So the bank should never ever do that. And, and that's the reason you trust your bank, is because they're going to create a stable URL with that transaction identifying it's going to be around forever, or as long as you, you, know, as long as you bank with them. So um, there's a lot, a lot of APIs that expose uh, JSON to it. Mm -hmm. Do you envision those APIs to be exposing JSON to other examples? Of I, I, I hope so. The only thing Twitter would have to do to expose JSON LD is add this context line to the top of their data. That's it. Right? And, and it, wouldn't, it wouldn't get give you all of the data, but it would map the vast majority of the Twitter data so that you could process it in your application. If Facebook did the same thing using the same mechanism, like if they, if they decided on some context, if, if all of the social networking companies got together and created a context and used the same context um, when they exposed their data, like Facebook could call this Facebook Creator and Twitter could call it Twitter Creator. But if the context that they use map it to the same URL, the same vocabulary term, then your application, once it expands it, sees the same data, right? It doesn't matter if it's a Facebook name or a Twitter name. When it's expanded, it's just name, right? And the, and the, and the machine, you know, the machine can then process it. Um, so you know, I, what we were trying to do is make it as easy as possible for people to adopt linked data. And the way that you do it is with one line context. Put that in your data, and boom, you've got JSON LD. Okay. So wait, what, what is a context? Is it a vocabulary? Is it bigger than a vocabulary? Uh, a context is a collection of vocabulary terms that you want to use in your application. So if you, what your application does is it, ex, ex, uh, it, it talks about people, your context is going to have all the terminology that you use to express a person. Their name, their birthday, their spouse, their you know, home page, where they were born, things like that. Would you use multiple vocabularies or, or is there a hierarchy? Yeah, yeah there is no hierarchy. It's you mash all the vocabularies together. You mash the vocabularies that you want together into the context. So the context can contain vocabulary terms from a thousand different vocabularies. If, if you can pull up the page one again, you'll see there are there are five or six different vocabularies. Do we want to do that? <laughs> yeah, I closed it. Do we, do we want to see that? How, how are we going to like meaningly mode and you can kind of talk about that stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Any other, any other questions before we move on? Well, other than payments, what, what other applications do you see enabled if you know the world at large adopts adopt this? Because, like for example, you know the devil's advocate is like, why would Twitter or Facebook do this unless it's like really beneficial to them? Mm -hmm. 
you know, then, you yeah. know, yeah, it's cool and it's greater good, all that stuff, but ultimately these are commercial entities, you know, and just primarily, you know, yeah. advancing yeah. So, so so we So we have a track record of, of companies actually coming together and working on something. So sure. schema.org was launched by Google, and Microsoft, Yandex, Yahoo, all joined in. So this sure. was for the RDFA stuff, yeah. uh, or microdata stuff, really. But they created their own vocabulary, and they said, if you want to show up higher in search engine rankings, use this vocabulary effectively. And that, those were all of the all of the search companies in the world jumped in and did that. And now we have a standardized way of expressing people, places, events, and things like that on web pages. The same thing could happen to uh, to Jason LD. if you know Facebook's REST API, Twitter's REST API. If those developers get together and they agree in some context then that data could be machine readable and exchangeable between Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus. Um, yeah, I'm thinking any any industry that has to share massive amounts of data. So genom genomic data, that kind of thing. Yeah, genomic data is already shared that way. Yeah. 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 Genomic data, data is already shared. Yeah. Yeah. All that's already shared. So yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. If you want to download the genome, that this is what you're going to get. It's not JSON LD, it's another syntax for the You could trust it as JSON LD. Yeah. Yeah. It's it bigger than JSON LD. Government services are another example. Governments want to publish open data. The UK is fantastic at publishing open data. The UK um, is incredible. Yeah, they've done a fantastic, amazing job at, at just jumping on link data and doing all their government services and link data. So you can do queries where you find out what potholes need to be filled and, and which jobs are open in the, in the, in the UK. Which government. lines of the Magna Carta are still in effect? Yeah. You can go and follow the entire so are, you, are you fighting a legacy with JSON LD by, because of all these other uh, industries, the government, etc., have, have sort of done the previous thing? It's interoperable with the yeah. previous thing. So okay. no, there's no there's no real legacy, right? If you click on his Inquads thing, you get a different you get a different serialization of the same information. Mm -hmm. It's fairly easy to move back and forth. I mean, the, the key thing we were trying to do with JSON-LD is basically get all the web developers on board. We've already got data scientists, people like that, academics on board, but the big thing that was missing is actually creating something useful for the web developer community <laughs> with tools that they were used to, used to using. Yeah. Um, again, speaking from experience here, this makes it very nearly trivial to take most reasonable JSON structures and turn them into link data you can then use it any way to take it to on the planet with very little in the way of additional overhead. Thank you. It's a great endorsement. <laughs> 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 there were a few yeah. problems, but they're working on <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. As long as you don't break it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>